So first up is Dan uh, Felski from Columbia, postdoctoral fellow, and he'll be uh, presenting on neuropathological correlates from molecular genetic causes of microglial activation in the elderly human brain. Take it away. So uh, as you heard from my supervisor, Phil, who just spoke, I'm going to talk more about microglia. I'm going to talk about a bit different aspect of microglia. Specifically, I'm going to talk about what it means for a microglia to be active morphologically, because Phil talked a lot about the molecular constituents of microglia and their heterogeneity and diversity in the brain. But I've been working on a, a study of characterizing the microglial activation state in the aging human brains that Phil talked about in this Religious Order Study Memory and Aging project. So a uh, quick recap of a very simple model of, of microglia and their activation as a part of Alzheimer's disease and really aging, microglia begin to lose their ability to regulate brain homeostasis. And what they are, they're the resident immune cells of the brain. And they eat bad things and they produce positive growth factors. They help sustain uh, neurons in their lifespan and they also help remove pathological insults in the brain. But they become dysfunctional in disease states and become angry or active in the state of dementia. So in Alzheimer's disease, this is known as early as the original pathologies were described over 100 years ago of amyloid plaques and tau tangles. Microglia are found active in these, in these plaques and deposits in the brain. So you can think of this chronic state of neuroinflammation as indicative of uh, Alzheimer's disease, a very known pathological observation. Uh, and it's, it's been shown only quite recently, actually, by looking in postmortem human tissue uh, that looking for active microglia, and they can be picked out based on their morphology, uh, there's an increase in active microglia in both early and late onset Alzheimer's disease when you compare it to control brains, whether they're old or young. So there's a disease-specific process going on here. We know that angry or active microglia are found together with pathologies in the brain, but we're not quite sure which pathologies, and looking at human brain, they are driving. We don't know where in the pathological cascade that uh, the microglial activation lies. Is it upstream or downstream of pathology? And we're not quite sure which genetic factors might predispose, uh, predispose someone to having uh, a different microglial state uh, in aging. So this is the data set that we have. These are pictures of what microglia at different stages of activation look like. So we have um, a very talented neuropathologist looking in four different brain regions in a subset of 225 of these uh, elderly subjects. You can see they're quite old, at average age of 89. Uh, and we've characterized the proportion or the density of stage one, stage two, and stage three microglia in these four brain regions. So we end up with several uh, density scores for each one of these. And what I've done is combined them into a phenotype, which I call spam affectionately. Uh, it's easier to say than what it is, which is the square root of the proportion of active microglia. So uh, what other studies have done and what individuals in our group have done when analyzing these data in the past is looked at the density of stage three microglia as a phenotype or the density of stage one. If you have an increase in all three stages, it's just an elevated number of microglia. If you have an elevation in stage three, you have more active microglia, or at least those with the morphological characteristics of activity or inflammation. But by taking the ratio, or more so the proportion of stage three over the total amount, and transforming it with the square root, I will show you and hopefully convince you that this is a very informative metric that we can use uh, to gain insight into uh, what it means to be an active microglia. So I'll show you what this score looks like in the cohort. Uh, first on the top row is what the distribution of all microglia in these human brains look like. So combining the densities of stage one, stage two, and stage three as counted in the brains, and it's been stratified by those individuals who have a pathological diagnosis of Alzheimer's and those who don't. And you can see there's really no discriminative capacity. If you're looking at the total density of microglia in the human brain, no matter which brain region you're measuring in, there's no real separation in terms of the distribution between diagnosis. But when you're looking only at the active microglia in the second row here, stage three, you do see some uh, differentiation between the groups, but only when it's measured in the cortex, not in the subcortical regions you see on the right. If you take the proportion of active microglia, or the SPAM score, I'm going to be referring to it as SPAM from now on, so you can just think it's the proportion, you get a much better separation of the two groups. Uh, you can see the distributions here are not normal, so some of the methods that I've gone with forward have, have taken this into account. We've done a lot of modeling to account for this, but I don't have time to get into that. But what's important to note from this slide is that 
Only when you measure in the cortical regions does a proportion of active microglia differentiate. And it is indeed the proportion that is most predictive, not just the count of active microglia. So it is not just important to know how many active microglia you have in the cortical regions, but also how many inactive or surveilling microglia you have. Information from both sides is, is important in, in developing a, a predictor, at least of postmortem Alzheimer's disease. And this shows the same data, but using a logistic regression framework, where we include a number of uh, covariates and build the model up. So these are receiver operating characteristics curves for uh, microglia densities and other variables measured in the temporal cortex and frontal cortex. The black dotted line, which lies quite close to the diagonal here, and these area under the curves are bootstrapped, um, which is why they are actually quite conservative compared to the true numbers. Covariates only in this cohort aren't actually able to predict postmortem Alzheimer's disease with any certainty. When you add in the APOE, major genetic risk factor, you, include, you, you increase the accuracy of the model by about 11%, which is quite good. You're explaining about 11, you're, you're, you're explaining about 11 of the variance in postmortem uh, diagnosis with APOE alone, which is quite good. If you then add on top of that the total count of microglia, that stage one, two, and three, as we saw, didn't discriminate between the groups, you actually don't get an increase over APOE. And that's what we saw with the distribution data. When you add active only to the model, you actually now increase by another 11%. But the SPAM score really boosts up to about 76% accuracy. So if you have a model including APOE and all of these covariates, as well as the SPAM measure percent active microglia, you can predict postmortem Alzheimer's disease in this cohort with 76% accuracy. So when building the model, we note that there's no interaction between the microglial activation and APOE. It's independent and it's additive, and it increases our prediction quite dramatically. Uh, to answer the question of, is this specific to the traditional Alzheimer's core pathologies, the amyloid plaques, the neurofibrillary tangles, uh, versus other known uh, pathologies that accumulate with age or are found in Alzheimer's disease, pure Alzheimer's disease is very rare. We don't find it much at all. It's a minority of cases. So is microglial activation driving or associated in this cohort with other pathologies? And we find uh, first, that it's only the cortical measures of SPAM that are associated with the core pathologies, and they are quite strongly. Uh, none of the limbic regions, the two limbic regions of the putamen and caudate were associated, but no other pathologies were strongly linked uh, to this score. And it's not just unique to score. Also, if we just take the stage three microglia uh, and look alone, the effects aren't as strong, but again, they are not actually associated with other measures of pathology, such as TD. P43, which we've heard earlier and is actually often found in Alzheimer's disease. And the cognitive decline variable that Phil mentioned, which is again in the same cohort, we have these longitudinal measures of cognition every year. So we have a single slope that describes the, uh, the change in cognition over time leading to death. And we see that the cortical spam again is associated with cognitive decline in all of the domains that we tested, um, though not quite as significantly in the midfrontal cortex as in the, the uh, temporal cortex, which again we might suspect because the temporal cortex is that which is first susceptible to neurodegeneration in Alzheimer's disease. Uh, finally, to just do the, the last phenotypic characterization of this score, uh, we performed some uh, mediation models to try to place this SPAM score, the activation of microglia, in the pathological cascade, assuming the prior up in the top left that the amyloid accumulation leads to uh, neurofibrillary tangle deposition, which then causes cognitive decline. This has been shown by modeling in our cohort to be valid statistically. And also, there's a lot of biological evidence that suggests that this is what is happening in Alzheimer's disease, at least one of the main pathways. So all of these lines uh, on the left-hand side just show where there is a significant uh, statistical evidence for direct and indirect effects. And what you want to take away from this slide is that in the bottom uh, two left pictures, there is no evidence for a direct effect of microglial activation on cognitive decline when tau is present in the model. And the same can be said here. There is a significant intermediate effect of tau uh, when you have microglia in the model. So it appears that uh, amyloid and microglial activation will affect each other, perhaps directionally, but there's no direct effect of microglial activation on cognitive decline, perhaps on uh, neuron loss, which would be downstream of, of tau accumulation and, and uh, neuronal death. Um, and we don't see that direct effect on, on cognitive decline. So now to get to the genomics. Everybody here is a geneticist. It's great you can talk to all these geneticists. Um, I don't have to explain then everything about this plot, but what it's showing is statistical evidence across the genome for 
single variants associated with each of the two SPAM measures that I showed were associated with pathology. So the inferior temporal cortex, midfrontal cortex, these are the Manhattan plots. Uh, and despite being enormously underpowered with 225 subjects, uh, this was, after all, designed to be an exploratory analysis. Very few data sets of this type exist. In fact, none do with the full complement of data that I'm presenting. Uh, we found for midfrontal cortex, one genome-wide hit, and for inferior temporal cortex, another genome-wide hit, both on chromosome 1, but they're independent loci. To carry forward into a replication data set, uh, we cannot, because there are, as I said, no other data sets that have this uh, post-mortem um, evaluation of microglial activation, as well as the genomic data. Uh, I was unable to really deal with this variant because it has such a low minor allele frequency. In fact, an interesting point is that there were only seven individuals in this cohort that had a one copy of this variant, but all seven of them were in the top 95th percentile of the SPAM score, so it's something to look at. We're going to go a bit further with this. However, this variant had a minor allele frequency that actually made it amenable to carrying forward to another experiment um, to measure in vivo neuroinflammation. So in the absence of a replication cohort, we actually had uh, positron emissions tomography imaging. So this is a method of in vivo imaging where you give a radio tracer with known binding properties in the brain to an individual that crosses the blood-brain barrier, and then we can measure the uh, radioactivity is given off by this uh, carbon-11 isotope to get a quantitative and regional measure of TSPO binding in the brain. And TSPO is a protein that's strongly upregulated in inflammation. So this is commonly, uh, commonly used as a model for neuroinflammation. And our collaborators at uh, Indiana University, the Alzheimer's Disease Center, Andrew Sakin and Quang Sik No, were able to do this analysis of us. And this is the top hit from our midfrontal SPAM score. And they found uh, that it also influenced the binding of TSPO, of this, this uh, radio ligand PET imaging, in the same direction for the same allele as we found in our GWAS. So perhaps our postmortem measure might also be translatable to an in vivo measure, although the sample size is quite low, but it's nice to see that this, this was, was present. And then finally, the very last step, uh, given that now we have GWAS data for the, the potential genetic foundation of this SPAM score, uh, what is the genetic correlation of risk for microglial activation with other known disorders? So using genetic summary statistics and uh, polygenic risk score software, precise, very commonly used, um, I did a, an iterative analysis where it, a different p-value threshold is chosen for the microglial GWAS and generated thousands and thousands of polygenic risk scores uh, at each p-value threshold and then essentially regressed the beta coefficients from our GWAS with beta coefficients from another published GWAS source to identify any relationship between the genetic causes of our SPAM score and the genetic causes of other illnesses. And this summarizes those results for about 22 uh, uh, published GWAS that range from Alzheimer's disease, ADHD, ALS. The take-home message from this slide is that uh, the correlation of the effect of the genes that influence SPAM with genes that influence other disorders really depends on the p-value threshold that you choose, but we see the strongest genetic correlation of our measure with Alzheimer's disease, which is encouraging, and interestingly also educational attainment, which is uh, an interesting thought that maybe microglial activation uh, in late life as measured late life, is actually somehow causally related to educational attainment in life, which we know is a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. So finally, take-home messages. It's the cortical and not the subcortical microglial activation that seems to be associated with Alzheimer's disease pathology, not other pathologies. Uh, the cortical spam, it might be partly genetically determined based on the GWAS results. There were results that were significant, but again, the sample size is too small for proper heritability estimates. Uh, and then the genetic predisposition to SPAM is also related to multiple other diseases, uh, primarily Alzheimer's disease, also educational attainment, but that's based on summary statistics. So thank you very much for your attention and the opportunity to speak here. <laughs>